Hey everyone, this is Daniel from What Obi Plays, and today we're going to do a full teardown and modding guide for the Ion Neo Flip 1 SDS. I'll show you how to completely tear this device down and build it back up, and we'll also go over some mods on how to make the buttons quieter. This is a premium, Windows-based, dual-screen clamshell gaming handheld powered by the AMD HX370 processor with a 7-inch 16x9 1080p OLED top display and a 4.5-inch 3x2 1620x1080 LCD bottom display, which happens to be the same display as their Pocket Ace. One of the reasons why I want to open this device up is to hopefully improve the thermals. The HX370 can generate a lot of heat and requires a very good cooling solution, and devices such as the One X Player F1 Pro do a great job at preventing thermal throttling when pushing the max 30 watts TDP. However, the Flip 1 SDS gets very hot and can reach up to 80 degrees Celsius when running at 30 watts, and starts to thermal throttle after 70 degrees, which as I showed in my review video, can cause your FPS in Cyberpunk to go from 50 down to about 35. I've had good experiences with Cryonaut Extreme on my Pocket Evo, so I'm hoping we get similar results. Here are the tools we will need, which are a Phillips 00 screwdriver, a spudger, tweezers, guitar pick, eye plastics tool if you want to remove the battery, and a magnetic mat. There are a lot of screws and they are not all the same size, so this mat will help keep our screws organized so we don't mix them up or have extras at the end. All the tools I'm using are linked in the description box below. If you use those affiliate links, I get a little kickback and that helps me pay for these devices since I buy everything myself. But let's go ahead and get started. Begin by powering the device off. Then remove the micro SD card if you have one and take off the stick caps. Slide off the grips on the back and then pop off the trigger caps. For the trigger caps, I find it easiest to pull them off from the side closest to the center and you want to be gentle but firm with these as the clips are delicate and you do not want to break them. With the lid closed, use your guitar pick to pop off the hinge cover. Then take out the 10 screws, 2 in each grip, 2 in each trigger well, and 2 along the hinge. Open the lid to about 90 degrees or enough so that you can work and insert your guitar pick between the edge and separate the clips. Make sure everything is separated including the top corners, and then turn the device around and run the pick along the hinge to separate those clips as well. Once everything is loose, grab the top edge and pry it off. There's nothing connecting the back shell to the device so don't worry about ripping a cable. If we look at the shell, there's this insulating tape that goes against the battery and we can remove these three screws on each of the left and right shoulder button housings. Once those are out, we can remove the housing as well as the custom buttons. The shoulders simply pop off and we can see the large dome switches which we will mod later in the video so set those aside for now. Remove this big sticker under the fan and set it aside. Disconnect the fan cable and take out the two screws on the fan and we can flip it up and pull it off with the tape. Use your tweezers to disconnect the right speaker cable and Wi-Fi antenna cables, pop off the ribbon cable on the right and then take out the two screws on the Wi-Fi daughter board and lift it out. There are three screws on the daughter board housing, one of them is somewhat hidden under this insulating tape. Once those are out, we can pivot the housing and lift it out. Loosen the SSD screw and we can remove the SSD. Then either peel back the warranty sticker on the left control housing or just remove it completely and pop off these two ribbon cables. There are six screws we need to remove on the left control housing and then we can pull the housing off. Use your spudger to pop off this big Wi-Fi daughter board ribbon cable. Ioneo handhelds almost always use threaded inserts for their screw holes, but for some reason they did not do that with these analog sticks, so I do not recommend taking these out unless you're replacing the sticks. We will have to remove the right stick later on, but I would leave this left stick alone. Remove these 5 screws on the heatsink and use your spudger along the bottom to pop it off. We can see the thermal paste seems pretty lackluster which could partially explain why the thermal performance is so bad and hopefully we can improve this. Sand the device up on the bottom edge and use your spudger to pop out the micro SD ribbon cable. Then take out the 3 screws on the housing and remove it. Pop off all 5 ribbon cables along the left side of the motherboard and this one on the right side. There are just 2 more screws along the top edge of the motherboard and then we can remove the very large motherboard. The motherboard has some thermal insulating tape on the back side as well as tape on the frame, which at least shows an attempt at insulating the bottom screen from the motherboard. Now you do not have to remove the battery to access the left and right controls, but you do if you want to access the bottom controls, since the battery covers some of the bottom daughterboard screws. You have two options, you can either open up these flaps on the plastic wrap, pull the battery out, and then pull off the plastic wrap, or you can remove the entire thing in one go. I'll be showing the second option, and that's where this eye plastics tool comes in handy. Insert the tool at the top right corner and I find it easier to stand the device up so you can see down as you rock the tool back and forth to separate the adhesive from the frame. It will look like it pops off very easily on camera, but that's because I've already done this a few times, so go slow and make sure you don't rip or dent any of the ribbon cables. 
the tool should glide above all the ribbon cables except the fourth one down which is directly attached to the battery. Be careful about the bottom ribbon cable, that one was pretty stuck to my battery and I had to be careful not to rip it. Once the battery is out, I put some captain tape on the lower half so it's still sticky at the top. This will make it so it stays in place but is still easy to remove if needed. For the left controls, remove the two ribbon cables on the bottom left of the daughter board. Then take out the four screws and we can remove the board. If we flip the board around, we can see that the D-pad uses dome switches and the start and select buttons use a different kind of dome switch. These large switches are the same ones as the shoulder buttons and are very tactile and clicky, but not too too loud. And these smaller gold ones are essentially silent but are much more mushy. Remove the D-pad and start and select buttons and we can see that the D-pad doesn't actually contact the frame at all. It's glued to the membrane, which means it's not clacky at all. Use your tweezers to disconnect the vibration motor and then take out the five screws on the right housing. Pull it off and then disconnect the three ribbon cables underneath. We do need to remove this analog stick so very carefully remove the two screws and it will lift right out. Again, make sure to not strip the screws since these are directly screwed into plastic and not a threaded insert. There are three screws on the daughter board and then the board will come out. Then remove the ABXY and INEO and home buttons and the membranes. If you remove the battery earlier, we can remove the bottom controls, so disconnect these two ribbon cables. Then take out the three screws and we can take out the board, but we need to use our spudger to help free the board from these clips. Go slow and work the board out of the clips and then pivot it up because there's a ribbon cable hiding underneath we need to pop off. Once the board is out, we can remove the membrane, volume, menu, and second screen buttons. I left the fingerprint sensor and IR nubbin alone. These are more set in stone and I didn't want to risk breaking them. Spotting the buttons is fairly straightforward. I put one layer of electrical tape on all the large dome switches, so the shoulder and custom buttons, the D-pad, and the ABXY buttons. Remember we don't need to do anything to these golden switches, they're already silent. Once you're done, it should look like this, where we got these little squares of tape covering each of the bigger dome switches. I also added 0.1mm TPU button rings to the ABXY buttons. If you're wondering what these rings are, check out my silent button mods video, but in a nutshell, these rings help dampen the sound of plastic hitting plastic when the button pops back up. We'll install these during the reassembly and then do a before and after comparison of the noise level. For the thermals, I want to try replacing the stock thermal paste with something better. First, we need to remove the old paste off of the HX370 chip and the heatsink, and I use these alcohol pads. I didn't feel like waiting for the excess alcohol to evaporate, so I used compressed air to make sure all the moisture from the pads was gone. Now to apply the Thermal Grizzly Cryonite Extreme Thermal Paste, I'll scoop some up with the included spatulas and spread it across the chip. I reinstalled the heatsink and screwed it down, and once all the screws are fully seated, you want to unscrew everything and take the heatsink off again. As suspected, there's some excess paste that leaked out of the edges of the chip, so I scraped the excess off and reinstalled the heatsink. I'll do a thermal test after reassembly, so let's start putting this thing back together. Put in the volume, menu, and second screen buttons back into their slots. They're keyed so you can only put the button in the correct slot in the correct orientation. Then lay the membrane over the top and set it into place. Hold the daughter board over the slot and reattach the ribbon cable on the left. Then pivot the board into place and push down to snap it back into the clips. Put in the three screws and then reattach the two ribbon cables. For the right controls, put in the ABXY, INEO, and home buttons and the membranes. Reinstall the daughter board and put in the three screws. Make sure you put the screws in these holes since some of these screw holes are for the housing or back shell. Put in the stick module and then the two screws and you want to be super careful about these screws since you're screwing directly into plastic. I tighten these only to the point when I start feeling more resistance so if you have to err on the side of under tightening them a bit that's better than over tightening. Reconnect the three ribbon cables then use your tweezers to reattach the vibration motor cable and then lay the housing into place and put in the five screws making sure to use these screw holes. Put in the D-pad, start and select buttons and membranes. For the D-pad, make sure the membrane cutout corresponds to this part of the frame. Reinstall the board and put in the four screws. Then reattach the two ribbon cables. For the battery, I highly recommend putting some captain tape on the lower half of the battery adhesive so that it's easier to remove if you ever need to access the bottom controls. The battery will still stick into place but might not be as secure. I don't think this is a big deal since the back shell sandwiches the battery so it won't be moving around. Pivot the motherboard under the ribbon cable connectors on the left and make sure it's not pinching the cables on the right and set it into place. 
Then put in the two screws along the top and reconnect the six ribbon cables. Put in the micro SD housing, making sure it goes under the ribbon cable. Then put in the three screws and reconnect the cable. Replace the heatsink and put in the five screws. I would put the bottom screw in before all the others since the alignment tolerances are tighter on that screw hole. Press the big Wi-Fi darter board ribbon cable back into place and then put the left housing into place. This left housing can be a bit of a pain since you need to feed this smaller ribbon cable through this hole on the housing. It can require some finagling with tweezers to get it through, but once you pull it through then you can set the housing into place. The analog stick cable goes on the left side of the housing, not through any hole. Put in the six screws, making sure to use these holes, and then reattach the two ribbon cables on the housing. Put the SSD back and secure it with the clip. Pivot the Wi-Fi darter board housing and put in the three screws. My top screw was held in place by the insulating tape, so I just had to screw it in. Then put the Wi-Fi daughter board on top and put in the two screws. Reconnect the Wi-Fi antenna cables first and then the right speaker cable. Tuck both the cables into this part of the frame so they stay out of the way. Put in the cooling fan and the two screws and then reconnect the cable. Reattach the black sticker on top and we're almost done. Put the custom buttons back into their slots and then reinstall each shoulder button housing and put in the three screws on each side. Now before we put the back shell on, we need to make sure the hinge is properly aligned. This side of the hinge has the top display ribbon cable that's coiled up and goes through this little metal tube. This metal tube needs to be pushed all the way into the slot, otherwise you won't be able to fully attach the back shell and the hinge will most likely not work. You can see my hinge has the metal piece pushed out slightly and if I close the hinge, I can actually move the screen and that side of the hinge isn't fully secured, which is really bad. What you want to do is open the lid and while pushing on the metal piece with your spudger, work the lid back and forth and the metal tube will slide into place. Keep doing this until the metal piece is all the way pushed in and flush with the plastic tube. It should look like this. Now we can push the back shell on. Open the hinge and go along the edges and push the shell together. Before screwing anything together, I would turn it on to make sure it boots. Since you open things up, the first boot might take longer than normal, so I wouldn't worry if it's not instantly booting up. Once you confirm it's working, then close the lid and put in the 10 screws. I would put in the trigger screws first, that way if you drop one into the shell, you don't have to take all the other screws out again. Then just slide the grips back into place, snap on the trigger caps, push the hinge cover and make sure it snaps into place all the way across, reinstall the stick caps and we're done. To test the buttons, I used a noise meter to capture noise levels for the ABXY, D-pad, and shoulder buttons. So now that we've added those TPU rings to the ABXY buttons and electrical tape to the dome switches, we'll do the same test and I'll show you the difference. As we can see, the ABXY buttons are now about 36 decibels, which is about a 56% drop from stock. If you're wondering how I calculated that 56%, since you might think a 12 decibel difference would equate to a 25% drop, check out this part of my silent button mods video where I go over some sound theory and how to calculate the perceived sound difference since decibels don't scale linearly. For the D-pad, remember the D-pad itself doesn't actually touch the frame, so it's inherently not clacky and is actually a pretty smart design. So the only noise will come from the dome switches and we're seeing a drop of about 30%. The shoulder buttons are now 39 dB, which is about a 40% drop from stock. And finally, the custom buttons are now 42 decibels, which is about a 20% drop from stock. Overall, these mods were fairly straightforward and we're seeing about a 35% decrease in noise on average. So I'm really happy with these results. For the thermals, remember that the Wildlife Extreme Stress Test failed with only a 64% thermal stability with the stock thermal paste. Rerunning the test again with the Cryonaut Extreme, and the results are unfortunately pretty disappointing. We're still failing with about the same stability percentage. However, these are only synthetic benchmarks, and if we go back to Cyberpunk, we see a slight improvement. We do start out again at around that 50 FPS, and we do eventually thermal throttle down to about 30, but the small silver lining here is that it takes longer for the attempts to get up to that throttling threshold. If we fast forward through time, it takes about four and a half minutes to start seeing the FPS drop, and then skipping ahead at around nine minutes, we see the thermal throttling settle again at about 75 degrees for the CPU and 30 FPS. However, if we set the TDP to 25 watts, we start out at 48 FPS, which is only a 2 FPS drop from 30 watts. We do thermal throttle, but only down to about 40 to 42 FPS, and the temps are stable at around 68 degrees. I let it sit for 20 minutes before I decided it was stable enough. I'm not 100% sure how much of an effect the Cryonaut Extreme Pace had on these temps and stability at 25 watts, but I would guess that it helped a little, just like it did at 30 watts. If you have a Flip 1 SDS, please let me know in the comments 
determines whether your FPS and temps are stable at 25 watts in Cyberpunk. Steam Deck preset with the FPS cap disabled, I'm really curious about that. Overall, I think changing the pace yields a very slight benefit to thermals, but I'm not sure it's worth the cost. Cryonaut Extreme is about $22 on Amazon, and while it did let us run at 30 watts longer than the stock pace before thermal throttling, the fact remains we still throttled in less than 10 minutes, and I'm sure you would play Cyberpunk for longer than that. FPS is stable when running at 25 watts, but unfortunately I did not think to test this scenario before I removed the stock paste, so I'm not sure if that's due to the new paste or not, and I can't recommend you go out and spend $22 if I can't definitively prove it's worth it. I hope you enjoyed this video, leave a like and comment below what you think of the Ioneo Flip 1S DS. Personally, I enjoyed taking this device apart, it was really cool to see how the all metal hinge is designed and also how the d-pad was designed to not be clacky at all. I thought that was a great design detail and I hope Ioneo can replicate that in future handhelds. I'm working on my Ioneo Pocket S2 Pro review and testing out a lot of GameHub games, so subscribe if you want to see that. That's all I have for you today, thanks and have a great day.